<laughs> okay, so this is episode 22 of the Honest Truth Podcast. We're here today with Jill Hamblin, who's the owner of Triarch Architecture and Design. That's me. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. So <laughs> Happy to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So also first-time podcaster. Yes. Right? Yes, so, a little nervous. Yeah, I understand that. This is a pretty pretty high stakes environment. This is this is intimidating. It's a uh, it's progressed. Yeah. You know, we're getting a little better, I think. I like uh, it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how far we can take this, but um so first tell us a little bit about you. How did you find yourself um in the field of architecture? So, um the my first memory of really thinking architecture was it is I was 7 years old and I used to watch my mother Um, If anybody remembers the Sears catalog, Mm -hmm. I remember it from Christmas, right? You'd circle 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 everything that you wanted. So apparently the Sears catalog also had house plans that you could purchase. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, my mom taught herself basically how to do house plans from that very creative person, super smart. She was a stay-at-home mom, but always had that buzz to do yeah. something in the background. So I would watch her draw house plans for people in my small town. Yeah. So so kind of getting an idea of what architecture was all about. And then when I was seven, I drew a perspective of my room hmm. and had it all decorated. I had all the furniture in there. I had pets and stuffed animals, you name it. So that was my first architectural drawing. Um, And then uh, fast forward to college, I couldn't decide for sure what I wanted to do. And I said, well, it's either going to be law, because I was on the debate team, Hmm. or architecture. Interesting. And the reason why I went with architecture is because every time I stood up to debate, I wanted to throw up. And I didn't want to live a life where I went (laughs) in to argue cases and throwing up all day long. So that's how I ended up in architecture. Okay. Kind of wild. That is kind of wild. Yeah. yeah. So are you from area, from Phoenix? Area? How did you come to arrive here? So um, grew up in southwest Missouri. Yeah. You can hear a little bit of that in the, the accent. Yes. The vowel's just uh, a little longer. Right. Just a little bit. Yeah. Um, so grew up there, um, lived there, went to college there, ended up in St. Louis. And then a firm in St. Louis asked me if I wanted to come out and open a branch office hmm. for their firm. Um, at that point, I was actually going through a divorce, and I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. I could, you know, redo, and nobody knows my backstory. So packed up with me and my 135-pound Newfoundland, (laughs) and we drove across country from St. Louis, and here I am now 22, almost 22 years later. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So Triarch. Yep. So tell us a little bit about how, I mean, that's kind of the genesis of Triarch, right? Yep. So you drive down so, and, and so let's that's do this. So Triarch actually was a springboard. Um, there were, at that point, for the firm that I moved out here with, we had built to about seven people. Mm-hmm. And there were three of us that were more senior. I had just had a baby girl. Um, and getting back into the work world, um, the three of us were sitting talking one day, and, and something just wasn't feeling right. And we were like, we, we really... We want to do this on our own. We want to make the decisions. Um, That wasn't going to happen with the parent company. So we said, all right, let's do this. We met for bagels. Triarch was born. Um, Literally, that's how quick the name came out. It was like Triarch, and we're like, done. Yeah. That was it. So um, that was 17 years ago. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. And... um, you know, it's it's really cute how you start a business and you're sort of like all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and, and you say, you know, you hang up the sign and sure enough, we're going to get business. Well, it started off that way and that was in 2006. Mm-hmm. And then in 2008, we started watching people around us just folding. And it, we just kind of kept our heads down and we were like, listen, uh, this this could get ugly. Yeah. So it didn't really hit us until 2010 2010, it started to get really ugly, and that's when I would say true business owners were born because you have to start making the hard decisions yeah. and figure out what do you do, how do you do it. Um, you rely very heavily on the people around you, really good, smart people around us. Yeah. So. so take me through some of the differences between you know being in and around and involved in the architecture versus mm-hmm. running an architecture business. So two, those are two totally different hats. Night and day. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing that I have discovered in the 17 years, I love business as much, 
if not even more, I'll say as much as being an architect and putting buildings together. I have loved um, learning about human resources, who would have thought, <laughs> finance. Like, if somebody's like, how do you want to spend your day? And I'll be like, give me a spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, so all of those things, operations, um, just figuring out what makes people tick. I think that that's really been the fun piece of it versus figuring out how a building goes together, figuring out how a firm works. Mm -hmm. Um, And building a company has just been an absolute blast. Um, I am starting to do more architecture again. Um, I guess the beauty of being in a business for a while is you begin to make choices about what you want to do. And when you have an amazing team around you, who can do a lot of those other things better than you ever could have imagined that you would do it, you get to kind of do the fun stuff again. So that's that's kind of the part that comes with, with time, right? So, Mm -hmm. so 17 years, you have an ability to, to hire the right people to take over certain operational things that maybe were encapsulating too much of your day. Yes. And, and now you get to kind of focus on, on the things that really, Mm -hmm. you know, that you want to do and where you can, you can take your expertise and your your experience and really start to become that mentor that that's always kind of a fun piece mm-hmm. and that yeah, and have your hands involved. I think we've noticed that with Ven over the last handful of years too. Um, so 2010 uh, is yeah. actually when we um, technically first started and bought the business in 2015, but 2010 is kind of when we got our start as well. <clears throat> and it's really only been in the last handful of years that that I've really tried to place a focus on making sure the right people are in the right spots, if yeah. that makes sense. Yes. It was always more about, um, you know, project manager here, estimator here, you know, this person there. And it's like, all right, we got, we got all the guys on base. Mm-hmm. But it's like, is that the right guy on base? Is that the right human at this position? And yeah. if we move these things around or brought in somebody that maybe, maybe we were hesitant at the beginning because of expenses or other things, you mm-hmm. know, but then it's like, well, if we do this, we can... There's opportunity costs that we were missing earlier on, right? And so I can appreciate that. I think that's really neat. What um, what type of architecture did you guys focus on, and has that changed over oh, the years? It's evolved dramatically. Yeah. Um, we're really kind of in a, a renaissance period for us um, that I feel like we are we're doing what we're meant to be doing, um, when we started off, and it was absolutely the right, right decision at the time, we said we're going to do small tenant improvement projects. Mm-hmm. We're going to be really excellent at doing what we do and be able to be moms because right. all three of the, the owners, we were all moms. So we knew that we had to balance those things. Um, little side note is we did get pushback on that notion um, we had some people in the industry who said, mm, you know what, they're, they're not really taking this seriously. It's kind of a part-time deal. Mm. Um, it was hard to hear. Yeah. It was really hard to hear. And so we did, we changed the message and we're like, okay, well, let's not, let's not go out and blatantly advertise that. Also not apologize for it, but let's just, you know, soften that message right. a little bit and continue to do what we knew we needed to do for us and build a really great firm. Yeah. So once we got to the point where the business was stable, we had a team that was incredibly well-rounded, we started really looking at, okay, what does it take to do the bigger projects? Yeah. And start to do some of that ground up stuff that, that we really love. I will admit fully, this is the geek in me, I missed wall sections and yeah. building <laughs> sections. Um, so really getting into those details. And so as we started doing more of that, the energy in the office just lifted. Mm -hmm. The beauty of that was, though, is here we had this amazing interiors, interior architecture team, right? So we had a strong interiors founding, and then we went in and built the architecture on top of it, which was really, you know, that was my my training and everything. So pulled that together, and so what we have is this interiors firm and architecture firm that collaborate on a level that I haven't seen before. You see it a lot in national firms. Yep. So um, you have to go to those bigger houses, but to have this local solid firm that is equally staffed with architects and interior designers that come together to make a really beautiful project, it's, it's pretty cool to see. Yeah. And that's coming together now. So how long do you think it took to earn your stripes, so to speak? I mean, it's funny to, to listen to you tell the story. It's very similar to how 
um, you know, kind of how contractors get their start as well, mm -hmm. right? We, you have to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to replace the carpet in the hallway. You have to do the small TIs, and yeah. and until you've done it, you can't do it again, right? And so right. there's a, a, a earn your stripes period. So mm -hmm. so what do you think that span for you in 17 years? Are you still earning your stripes? Have you arrived? Like like how do you how do you feel that process? Yeah, is going? I I feel like. I feel like earning your stripes is a daily thing. Yeah. I really do. Um, it, we just, we we love what we do. Um, a lot of times when you're building, you go into things and you're like, whoa, this is, this is a little bit bigger maybe than, than what we've done before. I'm a little bit nervous going in. And then you start doing it and you're like, nope, got it. We really, really have it. And again, you build the team around yeah. you, right? And you're like, oh, I, hey, I need your expertise over here. So I feel like that, we continue to earn our stripes, um, but we don't get out over our skis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's kind of that weird balance. Just building, You're just always building, yes. right? And taking yes. A few more pieces, just not ten pieces all yeah. at once, right? Yeah. Yep. So in today's world, I feel like architecture is different. And then as soon as I I want to say that, I I catch myself and say maybe the client need. For architecture mm -hmm. is different have you have you guys seen that how is architecture changing in your mind over the last yeah. handful of years and is it more rooted in client need or is it more rooted in true physical change in architecture um i think there's a little bit of both um so obviously technology always plays into that right and we're having lots of conversations about ai and if mm -hmm. you want to design a building you can go in and write this really long sentence and get something out right yep. so the idea of that could either be scary or it could be like this amazing tool that you tap onto. And we have said this for the longest time. When you hire us, you're really not hiring a commodity, you're renting our brain, mm -hmm. right? And my brain, problem solver, putting together all of the nuance of the building, looking at the end user, looking at the the practitioner, whatever mm -hmm. they're they're doing, figuring out who they are and what they want. And then you're putting all of that together and then you're coming up with something that yes has to be physically drawn and we do that beautifully. Yep. But it's that the the conceptual piece of it along with that technical, when you have both of those that come together, that's when the magic happens. Yeah. And I do think that that in our industry for the longest time we were pushed more to the commodity. I need a building permit, yep. right? Draw some lines, stamp it. I need it. a bid, so give me a set of drawings that I can yep. bid, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so where we've really found um, the place that we love being and we feel like is the best value is when we can do that conceptual piece with the technical piece. And and quite honestly, if we can have a GC on board with us during that process, oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's just amazing what happens when you're like, all right, all right, dude, I got this idea. And I really think this could be so beautiful, but I know when I'm going to throw it out there, the first thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to say, it's going to cost you a million dollars to do this one detail. So then whenever I can call you up and be like, Nick, I've got an idea. Yeah. Help me out. Can we, you, we yeah, this suss this out with me. I, <clears throat> yeah. I think we can do something really beautiful, but it doesn't need to cost a million bucks. Yeah. It's funny we were uh, we were up in Flagstaff over the last couple of weeks and and we went to um, a class with the 400 level students that we were speaking in, and we were talking about integrated project delivery, mm -hmm. um, and they were doing a really nice job of presenting the class and and the way that the that the class was portrayed, and the students had this opinion that if it's not contracted, it's not beneficial. So you and I have to be contracted together somehow, mm -hmm. otherwise we're not going to collaborate. And, and I, I kind of, I threw a flag on the play right away and I was like, hold on, that's, that's not realistic. In fact, yeah. most often we're not contracted together. You know, the, the traditional delivery model, at least in my world, and I know yours as well, mm -hmm. is not true integrated project delivery, but that doesn't mean that the project is not integrated in its delivery. Yes. Because what we learn early on in our careers is the more that we collaborate, the more that we make sure that this relationship works, the, the better off we are. Right. And as an owner, you don't want your kids fighting in the sandbox, right? Mm -mm. So like if you're gonna hire the architect and hire the hire the contractor, why would you want that to be a tumultuous right. relationship? So right. so having those conversations and being open and honest about that I think is is, you know, maybe not as 
well talked about as it should be, but it's really beneficial for everybody. It and, really is. And the more to that point, the more that we can bring in equipment vendors and and consultants and third parties and, you know, in the medical world, the nurses and the practitioners and the yeah. folks that are going to physically use the space, I mean, the better off we all are. Is it sometimes a little bit too many cooks in the kitchen? For sure. Mm-hmm. But to me, that's a better challenge to yeah. overcome as opposed to, you know, hurry up and draw detail and throw it over the fence and then I'll give you a Does price that's way too high and throw it over the fence. And yep. like, we just punch the wall down yeah. and just have a conversation and really like that way Streamline you're renting everything. everybody's brain. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and there's, cause there's, there's strengths on your side, there's strengths on our side. There's, there's information that we're missing always. always. And so we can get that information from the other folks and just really truly kind of integrate the delivery. And so I, I made a joke when we were um, standing in front of the students, they're asking all these questions and I'm like, I don't understand why it has to have a fancy name. It's literally just picking up the phone and speaking to the person on the other side of the fence. They're yeah. writing the test. Yeah. So you can get the questions and you can help infill the answers right. when this is happening at the same time. And a like, person-to-person conversation, always spot yes. on. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. that. So sit there behind my keyboard and just tell yeah. you that your detail stinks and you're going to sit there and tell me that my price is wrong. Right. It, it just it doesn't just make any fire sense. fire out and waste time. Just pick up the phone, right? Yeah. And And yeah. I think that... You know, on our projects that we've worked on together, we've had a ton of success in that. And then it really is beneficial to the client. Like, yes, it's beneficial to us. Yes, it's beneficial to you. But ultimately, it benefits the client. And that's and that's how these things kind of move forward, right? Yeah. The, the client benefit, when they see it, they know it. Until they've been in it and understand it, sometimes it may seem a little bit confusing. But it, it saves both of us time and it saves them money. Yeah. Like, it, it just, it it's like tangible. Yeah. Um, There's a couple of nuances about your business that I'm familiar with. And I think we have, we have some similar nuances, but um, how is the healthcare industry changing in your mind? And I'll, I'll kind of preload the the question, but um, we are seeing a lot of requests for um, evaluations of existing facilities. Mm -hmm. Like we always do, which has become in my opinion, more complicated um, we're seeing a lot of requests for refurbishments of existing spaces, which, mm-hmm. again, is complicated. And I think that's a function of a lot of infill, um, land prices, cost of lending, you know, all these fun things that people are dealing with. Yeah. But how are you seeing the healthcare industry change, and how have you adapted the business to meet some of those changes? So um, a lot of what we are doing has changed in the last couple of years. So we segued um, what was primarily a lot of imaging center work so that is not our core business anymore, and that's allowed us to go into other areas. Mm-hmm. And that's been – it's been really fascinating to watch. Um, obviously, ambulatory surgery centers, like we've done a lot of work in that space. Um, that is – I think it will remain a tricky space. Again, going into the existing facility, hey, this used to be a surgery center. We'd like to upgrade it a little bit. And then all the codes have changed. And right. like everything that we're looking at, we're like, mm, rip it out. Yep, emergency power, nope, not gonna work. HVAC, you're starting from scratch. Right. So it's it's frustrating, right? Because you look at this property and you're like, it Can't was- Can't we just change the sign? Right, don't you wish, <laughs> right? Yeah. If you've got um, 30 days, no changes to be made, and you know, maybe, sure. Um, the likelihood of that happening is- Right. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just not gonna happen. Um, and so, so that makes it more challenging and, and frustrating, rightfully so, right? These surgeons, they want to come in and start seeing cases, right? And doing the work. And if you're remodeling, looking at, we've done everything from, uh, shopping an old, um, um, grocery store, um, to of course, brand new construction. Um, ironically, the brand new construction was during the time that everything was going on with um, supply chain. Yeah. So you're thinking this is going to be so much easier. And we would have said that at the beginning. It's like, listen, this is clean. Like everything you want, you're getting because it's clean. You're starting it from scratch. And then that monkey wrench and then you've got, you know, 12 month delay. So, so it is um, not for the faint of heart. I will say that um, once they're in the center and operating 99% of the time. So very worth it. Right. Yeah. Cause it's your, it's your baby. It's exactly how you wanted it. It's what, you know, everything that you could dream of. Right. So, so that has been interesting, the education process. And a lot of times it's somebody who's starting this new, like they've maybe done another surgery center, but a lot of times we'll see people that were 
in a hospital and they're now moving out of the hospital to have their own space. And there's so many things behind the scenes that you don't know about. Well, all the creature comforts are gone. Yes, right? so yes. So all the creature comforts are we've we've had, you know, that that conversation on a variety of levels. And it's like, well, isn't everything just gonna kind of be provided for me? Yeah. Because it is at the hospital, right? Right. You know, and so it's not. No. Um, and so let's talk about what that is. And mm-hmm. and it's funny. It's like if you walked out of your house this morning and then you were stopped and said, all right, recreate every single thing that's in your kitchen right now. And, and oh, you, yeah. you, you can't, right? And, you nope. just, you, and so if you walk out of the hospital today and you're going to go open your own surgery center, think about all the things that you need for that to happen. So, right. I mean, it makes sense to hire experts that mm-hmm. know, you know, that know a lot about, you know, most of what you need. But, but most people don't understand, and I've had this conversation entirely way too many times recently, not every surgery center is the same because mm-hmm. not every doctor operates in the same fashion. And they I, may be the same specialty, yeah. but their surgery centers could be vastly different based on yep. their equipment suppliers, based on how they handle their procedures, based on how they want to clean their tools, right? I mean, yes. it just it just everything is totally everything. different. And so having that conversation up front, that, that initial kind of scoping is really, really important and really complicated. Yeah. I mean, if, if there was like a box checking list, it would be like a thousand Oh, yeah. Items, Everybody's you know? like, well, don't you just have the checklist? And it's like, no, this is like, it's like a gourmet meal. Yeah. Like every the time there's who, something that, right? that is new and exciting and different and, oh, let's introduce this new, you know, fancy beat and let's yeah. introduce this fancy, what, right? So you, like, there is, there's so much to that that, that those decisions were made for them at the hospital, right? So when somebody talks about a sterilizer, that it's it's not just well, I I just need the sterilizer, right? And it's like, well, let's let's talk. <laughs> you have options and a lot of options. So again, having the experts around you. The other thing that that we have found is, and this kind of goes back to being an entrepreneur and starting your own business, is a lot of times all of the operational pieces and I mean operations that's that's everything for getting licensure right you need to have your team and to be starting a surgery center and not have the ops team on board which mm-hmm. they usually don't right mm-hmm. why would you hire a, a lead nurse when you know it's going to be 12 18 months before you're starting right so it makes sense to do things in that order but then you're like hey I've hired this awesome like director they're coming in tomorrow and they're going to go through the plans with you. And they're like, everything's wrong here. Right. This is not the way we work. And what about this? And what about this? And you're like, whoa. So, so understanding all of the business stuff that's going to be happening behind the scenes and typically does happen behind the scenes, it's a lot. Well, and, and to help cater to that, I know you guys have done the same. We have folks on staff that understand that. Yeah. And know those questions. That's a different business model. Yes. So so to say that you're going to pursue, you know, yeah. those types of clients, uh, you know, we learned early on, if we don't have that expert on our side of the fence or working somebody working with somebody that has that expert, you're at a deficit immediately. For sure. And so, you know, we've made a conscious effort, I know you guys have as well, to focus on hiring people that have that background. Mm-hmm. And then we get to wear a label, right? So right. now now we wear a label that says that we're, you know, Ben's a healthcare contractor and Triarch's a healthcare architect. We do so much more. Right. So you guys do so much more. Yes. Tell we me do. about what else you guys work in. So so we actually have, you know, I said we've got this great foundation of architects and interiors. Yeah. And so that has played beautifully into the four sectors that we really focus on a lot. Um, healthcare being one, retail is another one that's super fun, um, multifamily. And then um, corporate office. Mm-hmm. So with those four sectors, the other really beautiful thing that we have found is when we have a meeting with somebody who's like, you know what, I, we're building a healthcare center, but we really want this to have a hospitality feel. We want people to walk in and feel like, you know, they're at Starbucks. Like th- we just want them to have that right. cool feeling. Guess what we do? We tap into our retail team and say talk let's share some of your ideas let's talk about yeah. what that design is all about um multi the overlap that we found there senior living i mean you go into it's a memory care kind of like a large healthcare it facility really yeah. Yeah, it really is it really is so so when those two come together so we had a um a big project that was a it was a great um the retreat at alameda and it was had memory care components to it and then um assisted living so John managed the project because he had done senior living multifamily 
Aaron was tapped in because of all his experience with understanding all of the regulations Mm -hmm. and being knee deep in all of that. So the two of them collaborated on, hey, let's talk through what the ratings need to be and make sure that I have everything covered. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so using leveraging the different sectors has really rounded out a lot of the work that we do, and it makes it more fun. Yeah, is is the foundation for you guys healthcare? Is that was that really kind of the first, I'll say, sector that you found success in and focused so, on? Oddly enough, before the economy went crazy, we were thirty percent retail, thirty three percent retail, thirty three percent healthcare, thirty three percent corporate office. Did, so, so of we the, started of the three of you. Was that where your backgrounds yes. were? Yes. Interesting. Isn't okay. that crazy? Yeah. And so then. We all came together, and then we found these amazing – it was actually a a married couple. Um, We hired both of them. Um, Laughingly, we said, you know, John, you're a great project manager, and sure, we can use you, but we really want Shannon (laughs) because she's, like, got, you know, knee-deep into operations and, like, understands all of that. So um, Shannon actually is our um, director of operations now, and John runs our multifamily group. So that was the addition of that extra piece, and we're like, this is really – this yeah. is really fun. So, so good overlap. So, it, are you guys in growth mode? What What's the future for Triarch look yeah. like? How How are you How are you handling that? Yeah, growth mode. Um, it, over the years, that has changed because you start off going, okay, how big do you want to be, and right. you throw out a number. Um, we is it a number found, for architect firms, by the way? It so it, the, I'm always it, it people is. ask me this all the time, and I'm always offended. That it's a revenue number, and that to me doesn't make any sense. I, I don't know why. I, I get it. I understand for all the nerds out there. Yeah. But but in my brain, it's not a revenue number. So is it a us, revenue it's, number? It's people. People it's number. People. Okay. It's a people. Which is kind of a function. I mean, if you had it's to break it down equation, to right? yeah, yeah to architecture in our widget, what is it that we produce? It's right. it's billable hours. Yeah. So that's people. Okay. Right. So that's kind of how you look at the the math behind it and yeah. figure out what you want the growth to be. But to put a stake in the ground and say we want to have, you know, 5 million in revenue, which equates to this many people. It, it was, we kept saying it, but it was really kind of disingenuous because yeah. it was like, well, that, but that's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're finding amazing clients. We're finding amazing architects, sometimes architect first, client second, sometimes client first, interior designer second, and we're building to that. So, so it's the growth hasn't really been a function of us saying we're going to, you know, put the flag out and then chase to the flag. It's where are we and what are we doing? Mm-hmm. Do I see that we will grow as a business? I do. Um, I see us getting a little bit bigger um, just based on how the sectors work and what it takes to have a really well-rounded team. Mm-hmm. Um, to be completely honest, for the first time since I can remember – we have all of the the teams are really well rounded, so what I'm going to see is that oh we we just got you know three projects and multifamily we really need to add to that team, so that's when we look out and say it's let's start with a project manager then we're going to get a junior project manager PA, and then we're going to get somebody who can come in and be the studio tech and draw. Yeah. So we just kind of build that way. So when you're building the team, how are you maintaining? that culture, that collaboration, mm-hmm. that, that same level of care yeah. that you guys have been, you know, known for over the years and you start to grow the team or continue to grow the team, it's a little harder to hang on to. So how, how are you holding on to that culture? It's, um, that is the most, um, that's, that's the part where my, like my heart just sings. I absolutely love this piece of the business, figuring out how to maintain the group that we are so one of my favorite times is at about 5 5 15 every afternoon almost almost every afternoon you start to hear this buzz in the office and like there's a conversation that's happening and it's like you know hey anybody have a detail based on this i'm trying to work through this and i and it starts and then one thing leads to the other and then you start to hear this laughter and everybody is just collaborating Mm -hmm. and sharing and laughing and it's just the coolest time and every time it's like meerkats they start (laughs) popping up from their desks right (laughs) so um the the way to maintain that is to hire people who who 
get the way you want to get things done. Um, w- one of the things that I think we've learned over time is that drama doesn't work well for us. Right. It's just not like there are some places is, it's like they can have this kind of dynamic where there's just always that that electricity in the air for us the electricity is going to be laughter. It's not going to be like, oh, my gosh, did you see what that person just produced for that client? Right. Wasn't that the ugliest thing you've ever seen? What is that person wearing today? That, it just it just doesn't work. Um, I grew up with boys, and I think maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah. Um, you know, if you've got something to say, it's <laughs> let's Here punch a wrestle, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so more of, of that attitude, we're not throwing punches in the office, just so you know. Um, but it, it's... Um, it's something that you have to recognize and work hard to avoid. So we, we use a, a way of hiring people that really aligns with who we are. Yeah. This is the way we do things. If you do things differently, that's the, it's not right or wrong. Right. It's just we know who we are. Most of the staff's in the office? Most of them in the office. We do, um, I would say on the average, people are in the office four days a week. So some five days. We've got a few that do two days Mm -hmm. um, remote. We've been pretty flexible. Um, I will say when we were all out of the office, I missed everybody, and I believe we all missed each other. Yeah. Um, There's just, there's collaboration that just happens that's really special and just adds a richness to, to the way we deliver projects. Yeah, I, I'm biased because, you know, we're obviously in the same <clears throat> same industry, but I, I think our industry feels unique in that mm-hmm. where, um, you know, I spoke with different folks and different clients that, you know, actually experienced an increase in productivity during yeah. COVID and, and had, you know, I don't want to say more success, but we're very successful, you know, with less folks in the office, yeah. reduce their office space, all these types of things. It's like, mm-hmm. maybe this is going to be the future for us. And, oh, my employees get to work at home. They're happy about that. Um, our folks were miserable. Yeah. And uh, and I don't, we didn't really comply with anything. So we were like 15 minutes where the office was shut down and then everybody yeah. was already yeah. back. So it was and like, we're back. It wasn't really, it wasn't really a thing. But yeah. I think our industry really lends itself towards collaboration. Um, yeah. And one of the things that we've experienced specifically over the last handful of years is we've been really, um, really focused on hiring folks early on in their career. So as, yes. as the company is, is growing, it, it's, it's fun for us to be able to be at the size where we can bring on more interns, where mm-hmm. we can bring on more folks. You know, we're, we're active at the recruiting fairs and, and we're bringing folks in out of college you know, which is something that we kind of hesitated to do early on because it it requires training. It does. And training takes time. Yeah. And when your staff is small and efficient, you don't have extra time. Yeah. Um, so now that we've gotten to that point, we've really loved having, you know, kind of the next wave of, of folks come in. And, you know, there's pros and cons to each generation. And, you know, there's a, a technological savviness with construction that's changing. Yeah. And, and that younger generation is all about it, all over it. But if we weren't able to open up a set of plans together mm-hmm. or to walk a job site together and look and at details and physically. talk to people and physically, like, you know, touch and feel these things, the, the virtual OAC is like the death of fun to me. Yes. And so, like, all, you know, all of these things are, are much more fun, you know, and I think help build culture. Agreed. So I, I think... Um, I was curious how you guys were dealing with that, but it's 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 not surprising to hear that most folks, you yeah. know, are kind of together all the time. Well, right? and and when you're a small enough firm. 